Well, I certainly think the one that's going to have the real game-changing impact on agriculture is the Operation Volendlele inputs on improving the transport systems in South Africa, most notably road and rail, and also the reforms around the ports and harbours. Um, obviously, this is a huge concern for the agricultural sector, the state of the roads and the state of rail in the country, because farmers have to get their produce to markets. Soft fruits and other uh, vegetables get damaged on potholed roads and roads that are impassable. And also, road uh, freight is very expensive uh, compared to rail. So if we can get the rail system up and running again with public-private partnerships, we can improve the transport system, it's going to make a big difference. And then, of course, the public-private partnerships that are planned for the ports is already starting to yield um, some results. And obviously, an expansion of these would mean that we would be able to massively improve on our export ability to other countries and get our goods to those other countries. So I think that, um, that there are a number of constraints uh, to growth that still exist. And one of these is obviously um, the uh, crime rate in South Africa. So uh, we have an incredibly high crime rate and it, adv and it disproportionately um, you know, affects you know, people who are, uh, are poorer in the country. And in rural areas particularly, this is a big problem, which is largely where uh, farming and agricultural activities take place. Our farm workers and our farmers are our most precious resource, but far too many of them are falling victim to violent criminals uh, in those areas due to a lack of policing and lack of implementation of a rural safety plan. So I do see the role of the department as one that would have to interact with the um, South African police uh, and, and the safety and security portfolio in order to assist with how can we fix rural safety. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there's a huge number of technologies that we could be leveraging to massively improve rural safety. Drone technology now would allow you to uh, patrol large areas for not only dealing with farm attacks, but also with stock theft and being able to get a drone in the air, track livestock that are being moved. Uh, already in a number of, uh, of rural areas, farmers are implementing sniper cameras where they're able to recognize uh, number plates, they're able to track down who's been in and out of a certain area, and this is becoming a deterrent against criminals in those areas. I believe we could be doing a lot more to roll those out. Uh, and I think by enhancing technology, you don't necessarily then need to have you know, as many people on the ground because you're able to direct your resources in a far more focused way. The drone picks up uh, people uh, herding cattle out of a farm or loading sheep onto a trailer. You can then send a vehicle there rather than having a vehicle patrolling on the other side of town when that's taking place. So I think that uh, massively improving the capacity with technology is going to be a big game changer. I think that we have an agreement with the European Union. We agreed on the phytosanitary protocols and these are not being adhered to by the European Union. Uh, and we believe that these citrus uh, restrictions are also not being fairly applied and that other countries who also supply citrus into the European Union are not being subject to the same uh, stringent uh, requirements. And that's not fair. Um, we have agreed that we should have access to the European market. We have an agreement in place. And the use of citrus black spots and, and false coddling moths are, I believe, a smokescreen to try and prevent our goods being able to reach the market in a significant way. Uh, I believe that, uh, that we can find each other on this. We obviously want to do business with the European Union. I think it's in the European Union's interest to do business with us. Uh, we do excellent citrus products, excellent agricultural products, and excellent livestock products. And I think these can benefit the European market and certainly European consumers. So I think that we must find a way to resolve this, but you cannot have a situation where um, false barriers are put up uh, to South African products. And that is why we are going into the WTO process. My department has provided scientific uh, backup to why South Africa's case must succeed. And we're looking forward to a fair arbitration and a normalization of that particular aspect of the trade. Again, it's very frustrating. You have agreements in place and then suddenly the borders are arbitrarily closed to South African goods. And this cannot be right or fair. I do think the situation has been inflamed by the looming election 
in Botswana. And of course, every country wants to make sure that it's producing at its own level. But I think in this instance that they are perhaps being a bit penny wise and pound foolish. Because when you block off products coming in, you drive up the local prices of food. And we've already seen the huge effect of lack of availability of food and high prices in places like Lesotho. So from a food security perspective, it doesn't make much sense to shut off. There's no ways that Botswana can produce enough to fill the market need. And they need those South African products to come in. So I believe that the Minister of uh, Trade and Industry and, uh, and Competition is in talks with his counterpart in Botswana particularly. And we hope to see a resolution of the process. I think that we can find a way forward that's mutually beneficial. Um, but it cannot just be that one country decides they wake up in the morning and say no more of these products because South African producers have contracts there. Uh, they spend a lot of money on transport to get their goods to the border and then turned away. Uh, that's not fair. It's not fair on them uh, and it's not fair on the consumers on the other side. So I, I think we can find each other. I think once the election is passed, I think maybe things will start to settle down a little bit and that you'll see South Africa's goods um, flowing there. What I'd want to avoid is a tit for tat uh, trade dispute where you say, well, you've stopped us on this, we're going to stop you on that. I don't think it's helpful. Um, that remains an option, but I think that talking and trying to get around the table to understand where they're coming from, but for them to understand where we're coming from is a far more constructive way to proceed. Yes, of course, uh, there are gaps in it, and it's why we will be um, running a review. There's a, a built-in uh, review process of the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. Uh, no plan is perfect. Uh, every plan can be improved upon and I think the two years that have, that have passed have allowed us to see which aspects of the plan are working, which are not, which need to be tweaked, which need to be enhanced, uh, what have been successful and how can we expand that with the rest of it. So I'm confident that the plan you know, will evolve over time in a way that ensures that we are able to achieve its ultimate result and the ultimate result is bigger value chains, more opportunities for farmers, both small and large, and the growth of South African export markets overseas and top quality animal health and plant health in the country. I think these are, uh, these are, uh, are incredible goals to, to work towards. And obviously the plan will, will speak to those over the coming years. If you look at, at the contribution of the agricultural sector to GDP over the last few years, it has been really holding up the you know, holding the, you're holding it up for the rest of the, the economy. There's agriculture shooting the lights out in terms of its contribution towards GDP. I think there are more opportunities that are available, um, and I think that the low-hanging fruit, pardon the pun, is export markets. I think that there are opportunities for us to export more to more markets. So it's about finding new markets for South African products, but also leveraging existing opportunities. I think we could be doing a lot more with the GOA, for instance, in terms of getting South African products into the American market, things like avocados and, and other agricultural products. I think we could be doing a lot more uh, with the European Union. Um, you know, we currently, because of the uh, poor state of biosecurity and the outbreaks of foot and mouth, uh, Namibia is selling their beef into the European Union. That should be South African beef going in there. We have an excellent product uh, in, in our, and our beef is of the highest quality and other red meats as well. So I think that there's a huge opportunity there for, for further growth, for foreign reserves to then be earned and for farmers to do well. The more you can drive the demand side of it, the more people at the farm gate side are going to be employed, the more profitability there is for farmers and, uh, and I think it's, a, it's just a, a beneficial uh, for the sector, but also for the South African economy. So biosecurity is, is, is one of them. Uh, it's absolutely essential. Um, both animal and plant health is very important. If we can improve biosecurity, we can demand higher prices for South African goods. And if South African goods become synonymous with high levels of biosecurity, uh, more markets will open up for us. And I think that there's huge opportunity there. Then I think that there's a lot of more opportunity using the blended finance model to assist smaller farmers and farmers starting out to be able to have successful operations. And to then also make sure that when we're looking at projects that the department does to assist small farmers, 
that we don't just go and say, well, you know, he has land, he has cabbage seeds, you know, he grow cabbages. But we don't then provide a market for those cabbages. What is the person going to do? They sit there with a field full of cabbages. They've got no transport. They've got no market. You know, they can only use them for local food security. So we have to find markets for, for their goods. And I think there's huge opportunity here for things like schools, prisons, hospitals, particularly for people in rural areas, to find market access. All of those institutions require food and to feed patients, to feed prisoners, to feed school children. And there's huge opportunity there. Uh, and then lastly, making sure that we keep a strong partnership between the sectoral bodies and the department so they understand that we're working towards creating a, a far more efficient, effective regulatory and legislative environment. Some of the legislation governing the sector dates back to 1947. The world has moved on. We want to keep our farmers on the cutting edge of, of international development, which means we have to be open to new products, to new technologies coming in, and we need to make sure that our legislative environment is nurturing of that. Uh, I think we can massively improve crop yields with new technologies, more crop yields, more profitability, more people hired to work, more to be able to sell and to provide our own food security. And then from a food security perspective, the protection and preservation of agricultural land. Agricultural land is up uh, against it. There's a lot of encroachment from uh, urban sprawl, also other industries like mining, etc. cetera, who want to, want to mine. And we must be very careful that we don't lose valuable agricultural land in the process that eventually means that we lose our ability to be a food secure country. And I think that, that making sure that we identify where the good quality agricultural land is in South Africa, where are our bread baskets, and how do we preserve those from potential encroachment. We already do most of our implementation work through provinces. And I had a very successful MINMEC meeting uh, two weeks ago with the MECs. And everyone's very keen to work together to, to grow the sector, particularly because everyone sees the job creation potential and economic development potential within the sector. So uh, most of our implementation is done through a provincial level. And of course, we're going to have to start working with local municipalities, mainly because a lot of them have an impact on agriculture. Let's take, for example, a simple thing like sewerage reticulation. When sewerage pump stations don't work at a municipal level, they pump sewerage into rivers. Those then find their way into irrigation schemes, and that bacteria and E. coli get spread onto crops, affecting the crop health. Then we lose big international contracts because we can't provide the quality. So there has to be an interface between the three spheres. COGTA as well is also responsible for natural disasters and disaster management. So we have to work closely with them to have, try and get natural disasters like fires and floods declared as natural disasters as quickly as possible so the support can flow in. Well, the split is still underway and we're waiting the final sort of delineation from the president. Um, but I think that from agriculture's perspective, it's going to be a very positive uh, split. If one looks back over the last decade, the land reform and rural development sector of the portfolio has sucked up a lot of the oxygen and energy. And I think it's going to be good for agriculture to be having a, a focus on the key priorities of food security, biosecurity, uh, finding international markets for South African goods and the like. I think that, uh, that having a minister that's going to be full-time focused on that part of, the, uh, of it is going to assist. And perhaps having a minister as well who's going to focus full-time on land reform and rural development will have an improved uh, performance there. Um, but the departments are still going to have to work quite closely together, even after the split, because rural development and agriculture go hand in hand. Land reform and agriculture go hand in hand, and there have to be synergies between the two departments going forward. Biggest priority at the end of the year, getting this biosecurity campaign up and running. Biosecurity must become everybody's responsibility. Uh, if you look how seriously other countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada take biosecurity, you can't just walk in to an airport from another country with fruit. It could have fruit fly or larvae in there that's endemic to that country, but not to yours. It spreads it, so there needs to be awareness from ports of entry to the farm gate, where farmers are responsible for the biosecurity on their farm. Um, then, of course, 
assisting um, through the blended finance scheme more farmers to be able to farm uh, and to turn small farmers into larger farmers, to move from subsistence farming to commercial farming because that's how you then create more jobs, you grow the local economies and you then ensure that that agriculture continues to be a net positive for GDP in the country.